All right, well, it's a pleasure to, to introduce uh, Dr. Yadav. Um, she is a board-certified neurologist. Uh, she did her residency in neurology and postdoctoral fellowship in neuroimmunology and multiple sclerosis at Oregon Health Science University and also at the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Portland, Oregon. Um, she is assistant, pardon me, associate professor of neurology and clinical director of the MS Center at OHSU. Um, her interest in, neuro in nutrition is long-standing. She may have developed uh, this growing up uh, and attending medical school in India. Um, at OHSU, there's a, quite a legacy of original work in nutrition and MS. And I think she's carrying on that, that torch proudly, uh, doing original research in, in this area. And she has numerous publications in MS and did a landmark study of a particular diet uh, in MS, which she's going to discuss with us. Um, she's authored five book chapter, chapters on the topic of uh, diet or complementary and alternative medicine in MS, plus several reviews on the topic. Uh, she also co-chaired the American Academy of Neurology um, MS CAM guidelines development author panel and uh, was first author on the resulting paper, which really has had an impact on the neurology com community, thinking about uh, nutrition and, and complementary and alternative medicine um, in MS. Her CV is about 11 pages long, and that's just the short version. So I'll just wrap it up with that. Uh, but please welcome Dr. Yadav. Thanks, Dr. Brown, for uh, the nice introduction. Uh, I'm Vijay Yadav, um, and uh, currently I'm a clinical director of the MS Center at OHSU. I've been at OHSU since 1997 when I started my residency there. And then I did my fellowship from there and uh, joined the faculty as well. And the journey there has been wonderful because I've had the luxury or rather and the privilege to work with uh, wonderful physicians, wonderful researchers, and being able to sort of uh, take my career to a path where you know I had never imagined that I was uh, going to be neurologist first of all, and then also neurologist, and then something to do with diet and MS. So that was completely a path you know which I had never thought about. And I think, frankly, the diet. When I was a medical student in India, I did not really realize the importance of diet as much at that time. But as I kind of grew my career and like saw the patients really really first hand, you know, with my own uh, caring and you know under my own um, care. That's when I realized I think we are missing something which needs to be brought upon and has not been taught to us in our medical training so far. And uh, just to give a background where the diet component came into picture. So when we were uh, when we were training as medical uh, the neurology residents, frankly I saw several MS patients and several stroke patients and all kinds of different diseases, but the diet was never part of our, uh, you know, uh, counseling of the patients or like nutrition was never part of, uh, uh, of the neurology care team. However, when I started my fellowship and um, what I realized was that we had a lot of uh, patients from Dr. Swank, and I talked a little bit more about Dr. Swank, who Dr. Swank was but he has been an iconic figure in the field uh, of MS as well as nutrition in MS. And I, we have several patients from his, uh, uh, when actually he was practicing, uh, he was chairman of neurology at OHSU in I think late 1970s or so. And he has several patients who were then followed in our clinic. And I got to see several of them as part of you know following the patients during my fellowship. And when people would bring up his name, Dr. Burrett, who is our, men, who is our uh, clinical director, uh, sorry, executive director as well as my mentor, so he would uh, recommend that, you know, yes, people should be doing spang diet, like do low-fat diet, but we did not really have a strong uh, research support to really, like, you know, make it uh, on a bigger scale or to discuss with other researchers and things like that. So Dr. Swank's work was, even the people who were recognizing it, they were very um, sort of devout followers of his diet in many ways, but. It was not being recommended by you know practitioners in general, so that's when we decided during fellowship that we need to do some systematic uh, study to really like in a scientific way, which should be conducted in a scientific way to really see where where this diet can take us. Does it have any role? Does it have any impact? So we started with a very small study, which I'll talk to you more in detail in the subsequent slides. But that's where you know the whole concept of nutrition and uh, MS started during my fellowship. And frankly, I think when we I, when I got involved in the study, it became even more apparent that you know, I think it's very, 
It's very close to the patient's heart, and then it needs to be followed even more going forward. And now, frankly, in the last 10 years, the last five years especially, the National Human Society has taken on a very big uh, uh, challenge of uh, kind of in involving wellness as a big approach in MS management. So it has really taken a really, uh, you know, upswing uh, as we speak right now. In fact, in coming years, there will be a lot more research, a lot more funding, a lot more program development based upon the wellness, overall wellness in our MS population. Because I think that's what matters. The quality of life matters in our patients. Yes, we have disease modifying therapy, but overall, how people feel about themselves and how they can live life, I think is probably the most important thing for everybody. So with small background, I think I'll uh, move on and then just talk a little bit about MS and not, of course, you know, give you an overview of MS by any means, but just to tell you, uh, many of you live with MS and you have loved ones with MS, so you know it is a disabling disease. And this data that we have presented here uh, talks about the natural history of MS, meaning how the patients will do as they move along in their, uh, in their disease. So from 15 years since the diagnosis, about 80% of patients will have, will have some level of function uh, limitation. And up to 50 to 60%, half or more of them will require some assistance when they are walking. And up to 70% of the patients will be limited or unable to perform native activities of daily living, which is daily activity, you know, routine stuff that we, uh, any normal person expect that they'll do. And 75% may not be employed. So this is from National History when people did not really have access to disease modifying therapy that we have available now. So things have changed now for better because many of our patients, in fact, I would say majority of the patients are on disease modifying therapy. So we are hoping that we are able to push all of this much later into the years or maybe not get to this point altogether. So having said that, the disease modifying therapy, they in the clinical trial when they are done, for example, most clinical trials they are done for like two years, one to two year period. During that time you don't really see as much impact on the disability as you see on the relapse rate or you see on the MRI disease activity which have become sort of the gold standard of you know outcome measurement. So but what we are interested in like how how the disability in a person changes as the time goes by and we do not really have good interventions to really um, you know to, uh, to prevent that. So that's why I think all of us, physicians, researchers, like patients, everybody is looking for different ways to prevent that disability in addition to the disease modifying therapy that they're taking. So that's why this whole concept of what we call core morbid conditions, uh, which are like diseases which are not MS related, but they are present in MS patients, for example, as Dr. Brown said, obesity, hypertension, heart disease, peripheral vascular disease, uh, smoking, all these different things can impact an MS patient adversely. So, and they are affecting the patient and then if we can improve some of these um, diseases or conditions, there is a room to improve the patient with MS in general. So that's why I think we are paying so much attention to all these comorbid conditions. So then again, as I said, like diet is a hugely popular um, topic in our in our patient population. National MS Society did a survey which was based upon uh, I think the the call centers that they have and where thousands of people are calling each year. They did a survey looking at what was the what was the number you know the top priorities of patients that they were asking for. So it looks like diet is number one topic among the patients who are um, you know calling the centers for uh, enhancing health or improving health or uh, changing uh, you know something that they can have control over. So again, it's a huge, huge topic. And of course, people want to have self-control. Like, you know, all of us want to have, like, you know, I want to control my life the best way I can, I can live my life. So that's diet and wellness approaches are one of the big ways that you know, one can control. Despite having the availability of disease modifying therapy, and disease modifying therapy, many of you are probably taking or uh, have known about the drug, uh, they have limitations. So none of them is a cure. None of them control the disease 100%. So they are partially effective, but at the same time, they also have several side effects that come with that. Be it interferons, which are like avenues or Revit or Vedasterone or Copaxone, they are injectables. So the interferons will give you flu-like symptoms and can affect the mood, it can affect pain, it can cause fatigue. Uh, Copaxone cause, can cause inject, like, you know, injection site reactions. The newer, older therapies can cause a variety of other problems, whether it's uh, immune suppression with lowering of white count infections, liver problems. 
disabling with PMS. So I mean, the whole uh, the risk factor which uh, which uh, or risk associated with the disease modifiers is huge. And I think it has made for us as a physician, to, uh, it's very challenging to uh, monitor patients with disease modifying therapy because it's affecting their life and also putting them risk of uh, putting them at risk of having diseases which we were not really dealing with before. And same thing is true for the symptomatic drugs as well. So drugs, for example, which are used for fatigue or bladder management will also give you a variety of other side effects. So to minimize those side effects and then fatigue, for example, is a very common symptom in our, in our patients. I mean, many of you are aware 70% of patients can have fatigue and 50% or so of, out of them will have such disabling fatigue that they affect their quality of life. They can't function well. So on top of it, if you add the disease modifying therapy plus the bladder medication plus baclofen or drugs which are you know used for spasticity management, all of that can make things worse. So we need better outcomes or better uh, interventions rather. So the thing is about diet. There's no consistent data. What is the right diet for a patient? What should they be eating? So there are no guidelines that you know we have been able to put together. So that's another thing that people just. Okay, since there is no guideline, you know, I'll just do what I feel is the best and you know, you read on internet, you read on different sources and they talk to people, talk to friends and family, internet resources become like, very popular. So you try to come with your own regimen that works for you. So I think that's what people are doing and we need to, uh, sometimes it can be a little harmful because people can go into some extreme measures which may not be healthy for them. So I think uh, as a... Uh, Providers, we have to have that. Uh, so we have to have something objective that we can share with our patient, that they can make choices in a, an educated manner. And then the other, the flip side is that the doctors themselves, for the providers themselves, health practitioners, they themselves are not as well trained in nutrition training or diet training. So in fact, throughout medical education, like you know, when a medical student is being trained to become a physician, the the education and nutrition is only for a few hours uh, throughout their curriculum. So you can imagine, you know, you need a much more intense program. Even though we deal with the top, I would say, four diseases that are the number one killers worldwide, they are all related to lifestyle, whether it's cancer, heart disease, or stroke, diabetes, all those things, they are mostly lifestyle related, but we do not really educate our, patients, our students or our you know, doctors that they need to be educated enough to be educate the patient, uh, to, uh, to then educate the patients then. So I think that that's a huge gap right there, which I think we are recognizing as a kind of university teachers or like, you know, uh, faculty, we recognize that this is a gap. And not only neurologists, I would say endocrinologists who deal with even hyperlipidemia or cardiologists who are dealing with heart disease or stroke neurologists, all of them are recognizing that there's a big gap between what we are telling our patients. So that, that gap has to be you know, filled in by more research and more education. <coughs> and I think part of the problem, another problem is ever since this disease modifying therapy came, we thought like we have an easy answer. We just give the medication to the patient, they'll be fine which I don't think actually is the right approach because patient is not just one pill or you have a whole person who is in front of you who has multiple issues that has to be dealt with in a very unique way. And personally, I feel every MS patient is unique because everybody will have something unique which is not really present in other patients. So you have to look individually like, you know, how you will fit that particular uh, care for that particular patient. So I think it's become very personalized care and people are recognizing. I'm not the only one saying that. So it's become recognized uh, th throughout the like you know uh, field right that we have to have customized care for each individual and uh, I think quality of care is big, or quality of life has actually become another big emphasis not only uh, in general but in clinical trials so now we are not only focusing on the number of relapses or number of MRI lesions change how uh, how they're happening or they entropy but we are looking at how did the quality of life change in that patient on a particular uh, drug or intervention. So I think that it, all of this is in a, uh, this change is in a good direction, and I think that's where we need to be heading. So uh, Dr. Brown talked about the role of uh, cardiac health and vascular uh, risk factors and vascular diseases and how the brain function can be affected. So I'm going to share some specific uh, data uh, from a research uh, study which has been sort of pioneered by Dr. Ruth and Marie. She's a uh, she's an MD PhD from. Uh, Canada and has done probably I think the most breakthrough uh, research in this field looking at how these different comorbid conditions can affect or impact our MS population and that is driving a whole slew of uh, interventions and research uh, in, in the coming years. 
So that different things that she looked at in her research were um, how did the effect of hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, or um, uh, diabetes, heart disease, cardiovascular disease affect MS function? So this is uh, sort of a summary of that uh, study that they published in 2010. It's a seminal article, published in 2010 Neurology, which is the, the most premier journal for uh, uh, neurological disorders. So this is based upon a survey of uh, about 9,000 patients who take part in this registry called the Narcons Registry. And so this is an online uh, sort of uh, data entry that people themselves are self-reporting. So they will enter when did they get diagnosed, when were they, when did they have the first symptom onset of MS, when did they have the need to uh, start using a cane or support to walk, and do they have other conditions like heart disease or high cholesterol and things like that. And then the researchers looked at if people had no none of these conditions, like they had completely healthy, um, completely healthy issue otherwise, versus people who had one or more of these conditions, what was the change in what was the difference between the disability in these two people, uh, these two populations? What this graph shows on the left, on the y-axis, you have proportion of people without unilateral walking assistance. And the x-axis is time from the diagnosis when they were diagnosed. And the dark line right here, the slope that you see, the dark slope, is the people, uh, is the group of people who do not have any vascular comorbid condition. So this is about 2,300 or so. And people who had one or more comorbid condition, which is roughly about 600 people here. And what the, the way graph is read is zero, meaning that they do not have any disability here. And as time goes by, <laughs> they start to have disability. So what you see here, people who have one or more vascular comorbidity, they tend to have earlier onset of disability, meaning trouble with walking. So early ambulation difficulty was seen, uh, almost six year difference between people who are healthy versus who are not healthy. I'm just using this healthy term because, you know, the vascular comorbidity presence or absence is healthy or not healthy. So people who had uh, no vascular risk factor, they had almost, uh, it took them 19 years to start to use a cane versus it took uh, 13 years for the people who had one or more of these disability. So you can just see six years is a big time, you know. So that just emphasizes that, you know, it's extremely important that we try to control these factors. And, um, and people who had, the, at the time of the MS diagnosis, if they had the presence of hypertension or uh, hyperlipidemia or heart disease, they had higher chances of getting disabled too. So it's important to re remember, you know, to stay healthy, basically. So um, the next slide just talks about a much uh, more recent research, which was just published last year. And uh, this talks about the impact the body weight can have on MS rates. And what we are finding that if um, the kids, like you, who are uh, less, I would say, like less than 18 years old, if they have higher uh, weight, meaning if they are overweight or obese, and when we say overweight, we uh, usually measure that by what we call BMI, or body mass index. So up to 18 to 25 is a normal range of BMI, and more than, so 25 to 29.9 is uh, overweight, and more than 30 is called obese. So those are the terminologies I'll be using. When I say obese, I mean BMI more than 30. When I say overweight, it means 20, BMI between 25 and 29.9, okay? So higher weight, any uh, anybody like with overweight or obese, they have higher risk of developing MS as well as earlier age of uh, onset of MS. So body weight has something to do with the MS risk. And not only that, the sub, this study, which was just uh, presented at um, in June of 2000 of uh, this year at the Consortium of Centers annual meeting, it looked at people retrospectively, and it was a five-year follow-up with 150 people with MS, and they tried to look up whether the presence of uh, higher weight or if there was a connection between the BMI and uh, brain MRI activity as well as disability uh, in MS population. So what they found was people who were overweight or obese, they had higher risk of having significant progression of MS disease markers, as well as symptoms more than people who are normal weight. So MS, yes. Okay, so the study in the children, are you saying that their risk factor was greater and it was more likely that they would have MS because of their weight, 
or do you think that the progression showing is like when a person has on diabetes because they are overweight, but then when they reduce their weight, the diabetes backs off? So the first thing is uh, the kids less than uh, 18 years of age who are obese have higher risk of MS than people who have normal weight. Or it's, a normal weight. it's a risk factor. It's a risk factor. proven risk factor. Correct. And it <laughs> tends to be more in females than in males. So that's another fact. But um, the second part was um, you were asking about... Well, I just know that when you have diabetes, some people have diabetes and it shows up when they become more overweight and then when they reduce their weight factor it goes away so that i'm not sure we have any studies looking at whether when you lose the weight or you improve the bmi the risk reduces that that i'm not aware of uh, yet what about in adults the so same things i do not think we have any data that you have reduced risk of ms with reducing your uh, bmi uh, as you you know go on Yes. Yep. Is it correlated to uh, to what? Okay, it's just weight, but how is it correlated to MS? Is it just um, cardiovascular health, or is how, how are they making the jump? So most of it is just a hypothesis right now. We do not know the right answer. So as Dr. Brown was saying that the obesity itself is an inflammatory condition. So it, it, obesity will uh, we sort of you know produce the body to be more in the inflamed because you can look at this marker called C-reactive protein which is just one of the marker of general inflammation. So people who are, have uh, obesity will have tend to have higher BM, a higher uh, C-reactive protein, just a general state of inflammation. Whether that systemic inflammation is then related to a related risk, we do not know that for sure. However, leptin, is one of, which is one of the edibokines that Dr. Brown was mentioning, that definitely has connection with BMI. So BMI and leptin, they, they are directly correlated. So higher the BMI, higher the leptin, and lower the BMI, lower the leptin. And leptin is a sort of biomarker for MS, not proven yet 100%, but it's like, you know, leaning towards that leptin may have some uh, pathogenic role in MS, but we do not know for sure. So these are like emerging data, that's emerging research, and that's why I think we have a lot more to learn going forward. What is leptin? Leptin is one of the molecules which is uh, which is sort of a marker for um, lipid metabolism, or uh, I, mean, I guess it's it's one of the inflammatory markers seen. In, it's a group of molecules which are seen in, in normal people as well, but it can be a marker of inflammation. It's one of the edibokines. So another uh, connection between you know fat or lipid as we call and MS. There have been some small studies early on. So this is a study from 2012, uh, sorry 2002, so almost 13 years now, which showed a possible connection between number of enhancing lesion on the MRI and the plasma level of total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. So we know bad cholesterol and we know good cholesterol. LDL considered to be uh, bad cholesterol. HDL is considered to be good cholesterol. So this was a very small study, just number, like 18 <coughs> subjects, but they had monthly MRIs. Uh, and this was a patient. This was a patient population where they had just had the very first attack of MS, so they did not really have the second attack. So they were called CIS or clinically isolated syndrome. And what they found was the total cholesterol had a sort of a quantitative relationship with the number of GAD enhancing lesions. For example, increase in total cholesterol about four milligrams per deciliter was was connect, was related to almost one enhancing lesion. In, these, uh, in this population. So just but a small number, but if you look at the monthly MRIs, that's not routinely done. So it says that there may be some connection between inflammation and uh, lipids here. Are you pleased to find gadolinium, the gad, whatever the lesion so type was? When we do the MRI, MRI is uh, imaging of the brain, which is uh, routinely done for MS, not only diagnosis, but also um, to kind of follow the patient, how they're doing with, with the disease modifying therapy. So when we do an MRI, we usually do different sequences. One of them is called um, a T1 sequence, which is usually um, T1 and T2 are two sequences, and then you give contrast to the uh, patient, and then you see whether the contrast shows any kind of, uh, does the contrast lit up, uh, get lit up in the brain, uh, on the brain MRI. So what the contrast enhancement means is that 
if the lesion is enhancing, meaning if it's lighting up in the brain, that means if there's a lesion in the brain which is active at this time, which is undergoing active inflammation um, and is basically damaging the brain uh, at the time of the MRI. So that's what we call GAD enhancing lesions, which are a marker of disease activity on MRI. So another study which was published in 2011 looked at if there was an association between the lipids and uh, MS worsening. So they looked at uh, neurological worsening by EDSS and uh, LDL or bad cholesterol and total cholesterol as well. And they, and they saw that there was um, <coughs> worsening with the higher LDL or higher total cholesterol and uh, higher HDL level, which is the good cholesterol, seemed to have lower contrast enhancing lesion volume. And if people had higher uh, total cholesterol, they tended to have lower or higher brain atrophy as well. So just connecting, the connecting the total cholesterol as well as the brain atrophy. So another uh, study which was published in 2013 looked at again the lipid profile and lesion formation, and these are 135 patients, uh, and they are again showing LDL cholesterol and total cholesterol higher the level higher the number of new lesions on the brain MRI. So and the question is like, how does the lipid change or how does, uh, sort of in line to what you were asking, you know, what is the possible underlying mechanism? Even though we do not understand that, well, that as well, what we know for sure is presence of high cholesterol in the blood reflects that the lipids are getting deposited in the blood vessels. And this is what happens as, uh, you know, uh, as we all age. So. During the first decade, first decade of life I'm talking about, so for, uh, usually there's not much deposition in the blood vessels uh, of this fatty layer, but as we all age and like, because MS is happening primarily in this, uh, like kind of between age 20 to 40 or age 20 to 50 is the key time when the disease starts to show at least symptom. This is where, uh, you know, in the meantime, you're also having the lipid deposition in the blood vessels of all of us, like will continue or will uh, sort of increase as the time goes by. So this is uh, typical for, you know, disease like heart disease or stroke. So this is what then leads to uh, blockage of the arteries and then leading to heart attack or strokes. We do not know whether this is the reason for MS patient getting worse as well, but this is sort of, I mean, we are whole body, you know, it's a whole same person. So something is playing together, and that's why uh, we, we, we do not know the true uh, connection, but it could be one of the reasons that, you know, people are getting worse because of this process. So then coming back to Dr. Uh, Swank and uh, how the diet uh, in uh, NMS came about. So he uh, was born in 1909 and died in 2008. And uh, what he did was, uh, so he was practiced, he was from Montreal, from Canada. And he, when he was practicing, this was, uh, I think, 1940s or 50s, when we did not really know much about MS, why it was, or uh, there were no medications for MS available at that time. And there were you know, thousands of patients worldwide uh, affected, by, affected by this disease. So what he observed, and similar, not just he, there were several researchers in that era who, uh, in that era, who noticed that MS seems to be happening uh, in areas which have higher saturated fat consumption in the diet. So the area that you see here are uh, the red are the areas where we have uh, highest prevalence of MS. So more than 100 per um, 100,000 population versus uh, areas which are green have very little um, MS uh, prevalence. But it's a, um, it's a similar area also where the saturated fat intake seems to be much higher. And this is what was observed in studies in 1940s and 1950s. And that led uh, Dr. Swank and a um, similar group of uh, people to do a sort of a dietary intervention. And he was a pioneer. He started the study in 1948 to 50. Um, actually, before I say that. So the, another study which actually was sort of highlighting whether there could be relationship between diet and MS was a study in, uh, in Norway where they looked at the prevalence of MS in uh, the coastal versus inland area within Norway. And what they found was MS was much less common in the coastal regions versus inland. And it was related to sort of the 
diet that the inland population was consuming, which seemed to be much higher in the animal fat versus the coastal was more like marine or fish waste or lower fat than the inland. So that was one observation, which I think then led him to do this intervention, which he restricted the saturated fat to a significantly low level. And the studies from that time suggest that the fat consumption or saturated fat consumption during that era was very high with the average consumption being about 125 gram of fat per day. So he limited the fat significantly lower to about 10 to 15 gram uh, of saturated fat per day intake. Uh, and again, protein coming from seafood and um, skim milk. He then followed about, uh, I would say, 150 people from then on, and then he followed them for about 50 years. So this study was sort of, it's not a randomized control trial as such, but he followed these 140 patients. Half of them were following a good diet, which was fine diet, and the other half was not doing anything, and they were sort of bad dieters. So how did you define a good dieter? Good dieter were uh, the group of people who were following this low-fat diet and consuming less than 20 grams of saturated fat versus bad dieter were group uh, who were consuming more than 20 grams of fat, or saturated fat per day. So the number of people in the beginning in each group were similar, 17 in the good and 74 in the bad diet group. So then you went back at subsequent years and then tried to see what was happening in the survival of these patients, how many were doing, um, how many were alive and how they were doing. So about 34 years later, they went and look, looked at both the groups and found that 23 out of the 70 people had died, whereas in the bad data group, 58 people had already died out of 74. And then by the time they went back in the year 2000, which was 50 years, uh, they found 15 survivors, uh, and then out of the 15, 30 were still uh, ambulatory and otherwise healthy, versus there were no more survivors in the year 2000. So not, uh, I mean, it's because it does not really have control as such, like, you know, which is, uh, ideally there would be a control group which is uh, not doing the diet or has comparison. That was not there. So people criticize the study and it's not really well accepted by the community. But if you just look at the diet intervention between the two groups and the survival rate, it's so stark because we believe that, you know, that it has some truth in it. And especially with the data that is coming, emerging now with the role of uh, vascular risk factors and obesity and all of that, people who are healthy versus not healthy, I think there has some, there has to be some truth in this data. So based upon this data, we then thought we will do a randomized control trial and that's what uh, we started in 2008. So this was, uh, we want to have a control and control was a waitlisted control. We included 61 people with the MS who had relapsing MS disease and we wanted to see whether a diet intervention can change anything on the brain MRI, because brain MRI is considered to be the gold standard for assessing disease activity in any clinical trial. Whether you take part, if anybody has taken part in a clinical trial, uh, especially with the disease modifying therapy, you know that they have to have uh, all these different specific measures with MRI being probably the like, highest standard or the gold standard in addition to the relapse and um, other outcomes. So we chose the MRI as the primary outcome, with uh, secondary outcomes being looking at relapse rate, disability, as well as the quality of life measures, fatigue, and some blood biomarker as well. So we randomized uh, 29 people to the weightless group, and 32 were randomized to the low-fat uh, plant-based group. So this diet that we chose was uh, uh, taught by Dr. McDougall, or John McDougall, uh, who is a disciple of Dr. Spine, but he is a completely plant-based uh, practitioner, meaning he, he teaches a, a diet which is a low-fat vegan diet. So this is what we chose for our, uh, our group and he had funded the study. So we followed the patients for uh, one year. The, patient, the, the way the training was set up, patients uh, took part in a 10-day program where they went to Santa Rosa and they learned to how to change the diet uh, themselves. Meaning, so they were uh, sort of embedded in a group of 50 or so people who were learning about how to make dietary changes. So they were um, they were fed similar meals, so it was buffet meal. They were taught by nutritionists how to change, how to how to change their diet, how or how to do shopping, how to eat outside, and so several like it was a pretty intense program, but very it's a life changing program. It's so, like to be able to immerse into a program where you are learning everything about how to change yourself. So, most of the people who came back from the program, uh, you know, they, their life was sort of upside down because they had 
to change their pantry altogether, they had to change their eating habits altogether. This was a dramatic change in their lifestyle. Uh, so that was sort of, you know, the intervention. And then the weightless group was just, they would see us on a regular basis every three months, but they did not really change their diet uh, as much. Uh, so in short, the diet that patients were um, advised to take was, uh, they could eat freely things which were uh, low in calorie density, such as fruits and vegetables. There was no restriction on how much vegetables or they could eat. Usually veggies are very low in uh, calories, so I mean, you will get very little calorie if you're eating like a bag of... Uh, uh, broccoli, for example, you know, so it's a really, really little uh, amount. Sugars uh, in the fruit, they can be a little tricky, so usually when we recommend, we recommend it more veggies than uh, fruits. They could also eat a lot of uh, uh, food which were uh, starchy, which, uh, starchy food, such as like, you know, whole grains or legumes, so they could eat those freely and relatively in the large portions, but they had to limit uh, food which were high in calorie density as well as extremely limit the food which were very high in calorie density, for example, nuts or seeds or oils and fat and uh, solid fat um, or junk food. So this was sort of the general um, outline of the patients in our study that that's what we were supposed to do. And these are some of the examples of what our uh, subjects ate, for example, pasta which was made in like very light oil or minimal oil and beans and uh, brown rice and corn and things like that. So one of the challenges with the diet study is that you cannot really uh, be sure whether the patients are compliant or not. Whether they're really, I mean, you taught them, but you do not know whether they can follow that and are they really following as you're doing the study. So the way we tested the compliance was uh, with this questionnaire called Food Frequency Questionnaire or FFQ. And these are standardized measures of uh, doing like, you know, when you do a diet study and nutrition study, these are standard questionnaires. That, so that's what we utilize for our patients. So we had uh, them done, done the questionnaire at the beginning, like at uh, month zero, and then subsequently we did that, and the subjects did that monthly. So that we could tell whether somebody is compliant or not compliant. So what you see here is uh, on the y-axis you have percentage calorie uh, as fat, like daily calorie as fat, and this is uh, x-axis is your as the time is going by, so people will follow for 12 months. And uh, you can see here the two groups, the diet group as well as uh, the control group. So blue is your control and red is your diet group. So at baseline, both groups were comparable with the, the, fat, the percentage of calorie coming from fat was closer to 38, 30, 38 to 40 percent in the two groups. And as the subjects underwent the training, the diet training program, which was done within two weeks of their randomization, so as they went to the training, you see that they were able to decrease their fat content dramatically lower with levels approaching 15 percent or so, and they were able to sort of sustain that throughout the study. And we had nutrition counselor throughout the study, and thus the patient would see us. So we had phone, uh, phone counseling available. So we were following these patients very closely throughout this time. You can also see that around the six month time, it's almost like honeymoon period, everything's looking good. Oh, I have changed my life, everything's going very well. But then after that, right, it's a difficult lifestyle, a difficult lifestyle to change. So then people are having a more difficult time around six months or so. And then you see uh, around like, so by the time they are coming back, it's like, yeah, tough to maintain you know, my diet and you know, I cannot eat outside, you know, I can enjoy the life with my family and friends because they are saying, what are you doing? You know, I'm, you know, so it's a very different uh, uh, kind of lifestyle here. But then by the time we are coming towards the study and then we start to know we have to do it, you have to do it because otherwise the study will not be uh, you know, good quality and all. So they were able to follow. But overall, as you can see, we had defined the compliance to be um, patients to be compliant by if they were able to do less than 20% of their uh, calorie coming from fat, they could be compliant. So with that parameter, we believe that people had a good compliance to the to our study versus the, if you look at the control, they remain sort of say where they were at the baseline. So I think it's a, even though the number is small, it's a good group to be comparing how they did over over the year. So then what we found at the, so we were, our outcome was measured at one year. So what we found that for some reason, the randomized uh, group, which was the diet group, had higher body weight to begin with, and uh, but they changed significantly. And as you can see, within the first month or two, they started to have significant decline in the weight, and they continued to lose throughout as the time went by. 
So on an average, the diet group lost 20 pounds over the one year period. There were people who lost 50, 60 pounds just by diet intervention. You know? So it was, and for them it was a big life, it was a big uh, positive change in their life because they felt so much better with so many outcomes. And on the other hand, if you look at the blue line, which is the weight, they were sort of uh, similar, maybe teeny bit, a uh, few pounds higher than the baseline. And this is BMI, which is sort of a reflection of the same thing. Um, and change in BMI was significant as the time went by. And you can see here the p-value of uh, less than 0.01 is highly significant. So the BMI was significantly improved as the time went by in the diet group alone. We also found beneficial improvement in the blood lipid. Uh, for example, we have LDL cholesterol and total cholesterol, and in the diet group, both of them improved as the time went by. And especially at the six month mark, they had significantly, um, what we call starting significant improvement in, in the two numbers. The, I would say the most uh, impressive thing that I, at least I found from, because I was seeing the patients throughout the, uh, we started the study in 2000, eight and finished in 2013, so for almost five year period, I saw these patients on a consistent basis. So the most, uh, at least for me, the most uh, satisfying part was the quality of life that they were reporting to me about how they're feeling better than what they had started. And one of the factors was fatigue had improved significantly. And you can see here, so we measure fatigue, again, these are standardized measures of doing fatigue management in MS population. So fatigue severity score or FSS and MFIS, MFIS is another score. And you can see there's almost 50% reduction in the fatigue score at one year period in the diet group. Versus if you look at the greatest group, slight increase, definitely no change. And what we, um, what we when we were doing the further analysis to try to understand what was the factor which was driving the fatigue improvement, it looks like the BMI change was directly correlating or was contributing most towards the change in fatigue. Okay, so improvement in BMI is likely connected to the fatigue improvement, uh, which in general is also true, but I think just to show that itself in our MS population, I, I, we thought it was uh, uh, impressive. And it's worth exploring further whether that will hold true. So I think that was our diet study. Then, um, the other diet which is very popular nowadays is Dr. Uh, Terry Walsh diet. So Dr. Terry Walsh, she's, um, she's an internist uh, and practices uh, in Iowa. She herself has MS, uh, which is recognized as second progressive MS. And she came up with this, uh, so she herself developed this program, uh, which is basically a, a plant, not plant-based, but initially you start with the sort of uh, high fiber uh, and colorful vegetables and that kind of intervention and then it's gradually add more uh, meat based protein and it's, it's called paleo diet. So I think what she's practicing is more like a paleo based, like where um, it's based on the notion that people in the paleo ages were much more healthier and we need to go back to the same style of eating or raw food and that kind of thing versus what we're doing right now. So this is another diet another diet that has been popular. However, the issue with this diet is it's not being tested in a clinical trial as such. So she's published two studies so far, but both of them are open label trial. Open label meaning that every person who took part in the study had the intervention, there was no comparable group. So if you just compare the pre and post intervention, it looks like there is improvement in fatigue as well as changes in the BMI, weight, all of those things are improving with the intervention as well. But whether or not, the claim for this diet is that it's going to be the life-changing diet and it's going to be the cure for MS, that, uh, that I'm not sure we can really claim, which is based upon you know, very limited data so far. But diet changes definitely can improve your quality of life, or can improve your health in general, and hence can improve your uh, MS disability. That, I think, has to be confirmed. Uh, I just want to share some of the data here because I think we all recognize that uh, we are, we live in a country, or rather we live in a, a, in a very, um, I should say we should be proud to be living in the US because I think we have the best standard of care, or medical care, or you know, medical type uh, that we have available here. However, we are not doing as good with what we choose to eat or what we are doing with our health in general. And which is, I think, the part of it is uh, 
our fault or like you know the, the way the food is given to us that that's I think partly is at fault. So this data is coming from 2009 and it shows overall what we are consuming as a, you know what is the food consumption uh, as a percent of calorie. Ideally, the processed food should be minimal, but we are consuming a lot of uh, processed food in our in our daily uh, intake. Animal food um, again should be. Uh, not as much as 25%, but we are consuming quite a bit of that as well. And plant food are really small, which should be a bigger portion of our uh, dietary intake. So this is what the population as a whole is doing. And I want to share the subsequent slide, which are just showing how the things have changed uh, in terms of the general health of the U.S. population uh, as the time has gone by. And this is just within the last you know, three decades or so. So you can see here the the blue color or lighter color, they, it tells you that the population is healthier. So if it's light blue, the number of people who are obese is less than 14%. If it's red, the number of people who are obese or percentage of people who are obese in the population uh, is more than 30%. So as you can see from 1990 through 99, things are changing in, in, the, in the worst direction. And by 2010, we had a huge population of our U.S. who are obese. So if you look at this graph, which is coming from uh, the 2000 census, and uh, it's looking at uh, looking at trend in, uh, in U.S. population, how many are overweight, obese, and extreme obesity uh, in the population 20 to 74 year old age. And again, it's tracking people from 1960 all the way to 2012. So very recent data, how things have changed. And the blue is men, um, red is women. And so just look at this data. If you look at the overweight population, if you look at 1960 versus 2012, there's not much change. So overweight meaning like people between BMI 25 to 29.9, they seem, seem to be sort of steady, maybe teeny bit of fluctuation. And same thing is true for, so men tend to be over versus uh, female, that's clearly a distinction here. But if you look at the obesity and people with extreme obesity, look at how things have changed in the worst direction from, I'm sorry. Things have gotten worse from, my, from late, late 70s to now. However, in the last, I would say, decade or so, things seem to have flattered. Having said that, <coughs> having said that, <coughs> tell me the number of people who are obese or overweight in the US is more than 70%. Okay. So it's a very sad state, uh, in my opinion, because I think in general, our population, we should be healthy. We cannot afford to be an unhealthy population because you know you have future generations. Our future, the country's future depends upon us and our health. So I think we ought to make a subconscious, oh, thank you, uh, some conscious decision about our health. And I think these are uh, really eye-opening numbers, not only for the public health, and frankly, I think health is with us. It's not with the doctors, so it's not with the policy makers, it is within us and we need to be the change, uh, the, we need to be the driver of the change here. <clears throat> similarly, if you look at the diabetes trend, as the obesity went up, similarly the uh, diabetes also has changed and we see all these fancy drugs or uh, advertisement on the TV or the internet or so, all these drugs are proved in that. The bottom line is you can reverse diabetes, you can cure diabetes by just getting back to your normal BMI and improving things significantly. This is what we are not teaching in our clinics. We are not teaching this to our medical students that we can cure diabetes, we can cure obesity, we can cure hyperlipidemia. And I think that's where we need to be making the major shift in our uh, healthcare. What do these diet experts say about milk? So milk is, uh, you know, I think, uh, so there are people in both areas that who are extremely negative about milk and who are like, you know, very positive. So I think we will come across, I think we need to be in the medium range where you need to use, uh, <laughs> frankly, I, think I personally do not know whether low fat versus high fat, which is a better milk, but uh, which is a better product. If you go with Dr. Swank, he would recommend that not, do not take anything which is more than 1% fat. 
uh, in the milk. So small amount is okay, but if you look at Dr. McDougall, he's completely anti-milk. You know, so you have these extremes, and I'm not sure. I would say just use your judgment that stay in the low-fat category. So if you look at the Institute of Medicine guidelines for what the fat content should be in the diet, they talk about 20 to 25 percent of your uh, calorie intake should be coming from fat. Dr. Swack is saying lower. McDougall is saying even lower. So these things, you know, whatever is making your health better, combination of diet and exercise is what you need to be doing to be able to get these numbers down. So that's, I think that's where the bottom line is. I'm not sure one thing here or there can make a big difference. So we have to be just cognizant of overall, like what we are doing, which is making our health better. So I think I'm switching gears now and just talk a little bit about vitamin D because I think it is important, more, uh, it's important and it has a little bit more data than what we have for diet and I think it's important for our people to recognize that. <coughs> And these are areas which have higher population and higher prevalence of MS. And again, areas in red are the ones which have higher density. And these are areas which also have a high prevalence of uh, vitamin D deficiency or uh, they are in the northern latitude. So we are looking for causes of MS or what is the, <coughs> what is, what is the reason people develop MS. We do not know that yet. But we have been looking for all these environmental factors, diet being one of them. We also are looking at UV or light or ultraviolet rays or sunlight exposure, vitamin D, all of that you know, is being explored or if there's some kind of virus which then initiates this kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> so what we have found, uh, what we know that northern latitude, latitudes definitely have higher prevalence of MS. And is there a connection between the latitude and the UV light and vitamin D? Current, currently the thinking is yes, there is a connection. So some of the studies they started, uh, which were started like you know in early 2000 and late 90s, they started looking at connection between the vitamin D level as well as uh, risk of MS. So one of the studies which was published in 2006, JAMA, showed that the high level of vitamin D levels in the blood seemed to have a, a lower risk of developing MS uh, among Caucasians, and then. There was another study which was looking at if you have low levels of vitamin D, it seems to be having higher risk of uh, having MS relapses. So this uh, study, which is again the same study which I just mentioned, relapsed the relationship between MS relapse and uh, the blood levels of vitamin D. So these are the results from uh, that study. What this is showing here is how many people remain relapse-free on the y-axis versus as the time went by, so the number of days that these patients were followed for. So the, the three lines that you see here is the dark and the sort of dashed and then these dotted lines. So the one which has the dotted line are the people or the group which had higher levels of vitamin D. So they were sufficient in vitamin D levels and they seem to have the lowest level of relapses versus people who had much lower level of vitamin D level, they had higher level of relapses. And uh, you can see it here, uh, they look at the actual um, levels of vitamin D by 25 hydroxy vitamin D and same thing here, the, the hazard of relapse goes up or the risk of relapse goes up as you have lower level. So this is measured in nanomole per, uh, the 25 hydroxy vitamin D is measured in nanomole per ml. For US we usually do that in nanogram per ml which is just divided by uh, 2.5. So if you divide this by 2.5, people who are in the 20 range will be really low, meaning they probably are close to you know five or six uh, blood level, which is really severe deficiency, versus a level of 60 between like 60, 75, 75 or so will be uh, comparable to what we have a level as 30, which is a lower limit of normal for us, and higher the level, the lower the risk of relapse. Okay, so I think as a physician, we are paying big attention to. Uh, to vitamin D, we make sure that we check our patient vitamin D level at least annually or twice a year. And if the levels are uh, low, meaning they are in the lower range of normal, we try to optimize and we push the level more towards upper limit of normal. And different people will have different uh, sort of threshold to get to that level in the same dose. So the same dose may not work for everybody. And there's, there are reasons for that why that does why, why that happens. The vitamin D is a fat soluble uh, vitamin, so people who have higher BMI or higher weight, they will need higher dosage of vitamin D and their level will be lower because uh, somehow the, the vitamin D gets distributed into the fat versus staying in the blood. 
so high, like high weight will also low, lead to lower vitamin levels. We also recommend many people because MS, as you know, affects uh, people in the younger, so it affects the young adults who are in the childbearing age or have kids who are younger. We recommend that people who have higher, who have uh, MS, make sure that their children are sufficient in vitamin D as well, because that may be one of the reasons that we can uh, decrease the risk of uh, MS in the children. So in conclusion, if somebody is asking me that what is the right diet, I do not know what the right answer is right now, because I don't think that we have, uh, we have that answer yet. Different diets have been tested. The diet that works the best so far would be the one which is able to keep your health optimal. Optimal meaning you do not have any of the health conditions that we talked about. Your BMI is normal. And uh, so I think that, that should be the goal right now. Whether you achieve it by like you know low-fat diet versus some other uh, intervention. In general, we recommend low-fat diet. That's what we tell our patients. Try to be in the low-fat uh, range. Uh, but in addition to the diet, also do exercise, as Dr. Brown was uh, recommending. That it's, both of them can really optimize the quality of life. Um, one thing is for sure, low-fat diet can help fatigue, whether it was because of the lowering of BMI or lowering of weight, do not know for sure, but it seems that at least from our experience, from our diet ex trial experience, it seems to help with the fatigue. And uh, the importance of vitamin D is because it can have a monetary uh, effects. So I think this is sort of uh, the general um, recommendation that we routinely practice in our, uh, in our clinic. Yes. Doctor, um, your recommendations for low-fat diets, um, you know, watching your BMI, no processed foods, can it be, is that the same for general population, not just MSP? That is for general population as well, okay. yes. If you look at, because I think we are trying to target the vascular risk by this in general. So, I, as I said, I do not know what the right uh, diet for MS is. Like, I don't think that we have diet which can cure MS. There are a lot of claims in the, in, you know, in the popular media about like, you know, this is the best diet. I don't think so we know the answer. So I think that's all for right now and we'll talk again later.